Be focusing on that. Demodex again is normal. We should have Demodex. That is a normal mite. It's not a bacterial pathogen. It's a normal mite that lives on our body. And the average human has about 2,000 of these Demodex mites across their entire body. They live in our hair, our eyebrows, um, and also within our meibomian glands. And the biggest thing that we found is this cylindrical sleeve that we have termed pathognomonic for diagnosing Demodex. And I mentioned how we'll give some answers throughout this lecture, but I also want to raise some questions. And this is one of the big ones is, is this cylindrical sleeve really pathognomonic? Where that term came from was um, from a few studies, but this is one of the main ones where they did a study of evaluating the last margin of um, several different cases. Um, this was done in 2005, where they had three different groups and they saw lashes that had a lot of that cylindrical dandruff. Then they had some lashes that had a few of them, not, not diffuse, but sporadic. And then they had a group that had completely clean lashes. So out of group A and B, which are the only two groups that have that cylindrical dandruff, they found when they put it under a microscope that 100% of those two groups had Demodex. So from that study, which is the main one that's referenced, we have come to the term, if you see that cylindrical sleeve, it's pathognomonic. That has been kind of the frontline study for a lot of us of saying, if I see that sleeve, I know for sure that that's a Demodex infestation and I need to treat it accordingly. Well, that was 2005, and this is 2021. So a lot of time has passed. And the other thing I'd like to point out is the number of cases. There were 55 clinical cases. Now, I will say in my own practice, if I did a study and or just evaluated 55 patients and I saw these results, that would probably be enough for me to realize, hey, this is most likely correct. I can you know, project that onto uh, the future cases. But for an actual full clinical study, that's not that many cases. So fast forward to 2019. This is another study, uh, far more patients, uh, close to 1,700 patients in both groups. And they evaluated that lash margin again. And they look for that cylindrical sleeve. Now, what we found in that study is, yes, if you find that cylindrical sleeve, it is still more common that it's Demodex than anything else. But it's not 100%. So what we'll see is for, for follicularum and brevis, the two different types of Demodex, if you have a cylindrical sleeve, you're about three times more likely that it's Demodex compared to something else. And for brevis, you're closer to about five times. Now that's significant. Three to five times more likely that it's Demodex compared to another etiology, that's very clinical significant and should raise your eyebrow of how you should treat that. But if you look at these percentages, 28%, 32%, that's not 100%. So I think we should start questioning, is it pathognomonic or not? So the other reason of why that discrepancy in those percentages is because of how we're diagnosing it. So we're going to get into a little bit of geometry. Back to our elementary school days, secondary school days. Let's go into what's a cylinder and what's a dome. And why would I be talking about geometry? Well, I think it's clinically impactful. I want you to look at these two different images, the one on the left and the one on the right. The one on the right is what most people and in studies have shown pathognomonic for Demodex, that nice cylindrical formation. That is more likely to be Demodex. The one on the left, now while it looks completely different, in clinic, you may be, it may be hard if you don't see that picture side by side. The difference is you see this dome, dome formation. It's not quite a full cylinder. It comes to a point. That is biofilm. That is actually more likely a bacterial manifestation of anterior blepharitis, that staph epidermis that we talked about compared to some of the other bacterial loads on the, um, on the lash margin. So that could be the reason for that discrepancy of our diagnosis. If we see these little formulations around the lash, we could just assume, well, it's all Demodex. That's not entirely true. We have to realize that difference. And you can see it. It's a little bit more oily, a little bit more waxy, a little bit more glistening to the stage of blepharitis, while as the Demodex, almost perfect cylinder, not as waxy, not as oily, 
that's where the Demodex is actually living underneath. So the studies show that it's not quite 100%, but our diagnosis of it might be part of the reason. So the question that I mentioned, start thinking about when you see those sleeves, are we sure that it's 100% Demodex? Is it pathognomonic? That's one thing that we need to start questioning. And again, a big part of that is our diagnosis. Are we seeing that full cylindrical sleeve? Are we seeing demodex mites crawl across the lid and lash margin? Or is it more biofilm formation? And that might be more prominent than we actually think. And the importance of knowing that difference is our treatment protocols are completely different. We know that tea tree oil formulations have exploded in the ocular surface disease, disease environment. And we know that's what we really need to use to kill demodex. Well, that may not be necessary for anterior blepharitis. And our traditional anterior blepharitis treatments with uh, surfactants such as Ocusoft lid scrubs and, and uh, uh, the other competitors, those foams and lid scrubs will not be effective at Demodex. So we need to know what we're actually treating for our treatments to be effective. So going back to the question, where do we start? Do we start from the front? Do we go to the back? Do we start treating corneal and conjunctival tissue or do we start from the lid and last uh, surface? So I would say it, it's a tough question to answer. I believe that most of this will start from the front. I believe it'll start from a biofilm or a demodex pro proliferation that causes meibomian gland dysfunction and that lack of lipid production then leads to ocular surface inflammation and leads to the conjunctival and corneal problems we see. But if a patient comes in and they have diffuse keratitis, are you going to treat the the causing root first, they might be in terrible condition. It's kind of like when a house is on fire. Well, if it was caused by an electricity issue, are you going to solve that or are you going to put the fire out? Sometimes you just have to put the fire out. So if you see diffuse and rampant keratitis or conjunctival staining, sometimes you need to address that first just to get the patient comfortable and to a stage where the chronic therapy will be effective. But eventually, you need to treat the chronic underlying issue, which is usually lid and lash margin disease. And if you never tolerate it, all you're doing is putting more and more bandages on. 